Would you believe me if I said I grew up in a shipwreck, like the lady next week? Not quite, but I started diving when I was 16. So I've been at it uh, two or three years at this point. Um, I've been a resident of Michigan now for 15 years. And so what you're going to hear about tonight are the shipwrecks that we've uh, that, that have been lost and then found in the last 15 years. So it's been an exciting 15 years, and I'm very happy to have uh, a Kalamazoo resident, Art Albin here, who, uh, and his son, and uh, he actually participated in getting, getting the group that I now represent started 15 years ago, so kind of neat to have you here, Art. But lost and found shipwrecks of West Michigan, so off of our shores, we're a little bit inboard here, but we're going to talk about the, the uh, history off of the uh, lake, uh, in Lake Michigan, off of West Michigan. And I think when I show you these few images of shipwrecks, you'll get maybe a different feel uh, for what they are. When I originally, uh, many, many years ago, heard about a shipwreck, I, I thought about something that's dark and dangerous. And, and the, the name wreck suggests that it's something um, that wouldn't look very good, but these images show you just how very evocative these shipwrecks can be. Um, it's amazing, a perspective like this on a very intact schooner. It feels like you're going back in time uh, when you go beneath the lake to take a look at it. And um, really, the act of diving um, on these historic shipwrecks makes you wonder about the crew and about the cargoes and why they were out there and why the ships went down. And so uh, seeing them firsthand um, helps us understand that. Now I'll answer a question. I see a couple kids in the audience. I do uh, programs for a lot of school groups. And the question I in invariably get is, how are you writing underwater? <laughs> and uh, I, I don't usually think to, to talk about that because it's so uh, obvious to me. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, but I'm using a regular number two pencil on a plasticized paper called Mylar. I started um, many years ago in the architectural business, so it was very uh, normal for me to draw structure. And so a lot of what I've done over the years is record these shipwrecks, and it's, it's fairly easy underwater to do that with a pencil. But when I see an image like this, it makes me think, whose hands were on that wheel moments before it plunged beneath the lake. It makes us think about the people, many of the people that were lost with these shipwrecks. And when I um, see the satellite image of the Great Lakes, um, I think about uh, the recreational opportunities that we all have. Kalamazoo here is not that far from the lake. I'm sure a lot of you head, head over to Benton Harbor, St. Joe, or South Haven to enjoy the beach. But when I see the satellite image, I see highways. I don't know if any of you see highways. But the Great Lakes, um, when uh, the Midwest was really first habitated, um, are, are a, a water-based highway system. We, we know we can get from the ocean through the St. Lawrence Seaway or through the Erie Canal into the Great Lakes, and you literally don't have to leave the water to get all the way over to uh, Duluth on the far western side. Um, now, when I think of those shipwrecks, and, and Art, I'm sure, thinks about it, we think about all the many thousands of ships that have gone missing over the years. These graphical maps are a little exaggerated, uh, obviously, in their scale, but there are anywhere from six to 10,000 shipwrecks known to have gone down in the Great Lakes. And believe it or not, Lake Michigan really has the highest percentage of all of those. And that's largely due to the uh, lack of natural harbors along uh, Lake Michigan and the busy cities of Chicago and Milwaukee. Lake Superior, I think we all think of as a more um, dangerous, windswept lake, but uh, the, the ports up there were uh, not as busy as uh, Chicago and Milwaukee. So we've got our fair share of shipwrecks. But what we're going to do tonight is hone in on uh, the shipwrecks off the shores of West Michigan, really the Indiana border up to about Holland. I'm from Holland, and so we've sort of selected our area of study based on where uh, we're located. I'm part of a group now that's um, called Michigan Shipwreck Research Associates, a nonprofit organization, um, and our mission is really to search discover these shipwrecks, but most important is to interpret them in ways that we can all um, understand, learn from, and uh, uh, hopefully be inspired. Uh, when I moved over to uh, Holland from Chicago, I'm originally from Chicago, 
uh, I, I married, I was actually telling Art that I, it's coming up on my 15th wedding anniversary, and when I moved over from Chicago, uh, like all good wives do, new, new brides, first question we have of our husbands are, where are all the shipwrecks? Wouldn't we worry about that? That's what I worried about. And um, what my husband, Jack, who is also a diver, uh, told me is there really weren't many off the shores of West Michigan. So I was moving over to uncharted territory. There were quite a few in Chicago. And one of the ships that captured my interest, I know Art recognizes this ship, 15 years ago, we became very enamored of the story of the Chikora, a ship that simply went missing, sailed through a crack in the lake in 1895. It was leaving St. Joe, Michigan to go to Wisconsin, pick up a load of winter harvested wheat and bring it back to St. Joseph, and it disappeared. In the days that followed, uh, debris came ashore, but no people. So 25 men were lost with his ship in 1895. And it sort of captured the attention of local communities. It's been a mystery uh, for a number of years. And we set out uh, uh, upon a mission to find that shipwreck. Now, facing the lake, looking out, um, wondering how we we're going to go about that, a very difficult task. What we thought is we could just head out there and look for the red X on the water, because X marks the spot. <laughs> and then it, we realized it was going to be a little harder than that. And what we actually have to do in order to even begin looking for shipwreck is we have to spend a lot of time in libraries like this, researching um, old newspaper accounts. It's amazing. Here's the Chikora headline from 1895, and you can read it on microfilm like it happened yesterday. I'll bet you this library has microfilm records of the newspapers that reported its loss. And so we spend quite a bit of time looking at old weather records, trying to figure out if the debris came to shore here, where did the ship go down, and it's a puzzle. But then you need some technology to search. And what we found um, back even 15 years ago, what the uh, experts were using is a device called side scan sonar. It's a, it's, we call this a, a fish because it rides below the water. It's sending out acoustical impulses and when those acoustical impulses bounce off something that's sitting up on top of the, the lake bottom, they print out a picture either on a, uh, on a paper plotter, which we're still using, or a more sophisticated computer monitor now. So if we see something like this printing out on the paper, we know we found a shipwreck. We don't know which one until we get down there and take a look. Now for the last uh, 13 years, we've been partnering with David Trotter. He's a man from the... Um, uh, Detroit area and maybe in this library there's a book called Shipwreck Hunter Deep Dark and Deadly and it's a book about David he's found uh, about 90 shipwrecks in 30 some years of looking so he's been very successful we partnered with him um, 13 years ago and we uh, utilize his expertise we utilize his side scan he comes over we install it on our boat my husband's an engineer he's designed some fancy equipment if uh, some of you are wondering if I operate a, a Chinese restaurant in my uh, real life, I don't. We have two kids from China, so we named uh, our boat after them. But our little family uh, recreational boat becomes a high-tech research vessel for about 10 days each year. And so when we find a target like you saw, then it's time to get on the equipment and go down and take a look and see if we can identify what we found. Um, the waters off West Michigan are really uh, very deep. They go very deep very quickly. So about three miles offshore, you're already in 100 feet of water. Many of the ships we're finding, you'll see, are in very deep water. So if you recognize divers as the uh, folks wearing a tank on their back and maybe a rubber suit, we're wearing oftentimes two tanks on our back, a couple tanks slung from our front for extra air, operating equipment. It's, it's uh, called technical diving when you go deep. So it's, uh, it's not easy. And searching, um, what we're essentially doing is from our research we're defining an area where we think a ship might have gone down and then we're mowing the lawn we're taking the boat back and forth very slowly about four miles an hour and when we're done we've completely covered an area like this we know everything that's down there and for the most part there's a lot of sand down there and um, over the last 13 years can you believe this art <laughs> look at all this coverage We've covered about 350 square miles, and we've had uh, uh, many successes, about uh, 13 different shipwrecks in that amount of time. 
Now you might be wondering what are all those crazy colors. Each color is a different year that we've been searching. Each conglomeration of color is a, a search for a particular shipwreck. We've looked in this area for the Chikora, the first ship that we've uh, started looking for, nothing. We would have sworn it was down there, but haven't found it. Um, but we have found all these other vessels. And the interesting thing about what we found is they span the entire range of commercial shipping on the Great Lakes. So very um, serendipitously, we in exploring these shipwrecks have taken uh, history from the uh, early lake schooners to the modern day self unloaders. So it's really been um, uh, exploration that has taught us quite a bit about our maritime history. And I wanna start and go chronologically here, start with the schooners. This isn't the order that we've found things in, but it's gonna make a little bit more sense to look at them in the uh, evolution of shipping. And so the lake schooners are certainly the earliest vessels, the, the uh, sailing vessels came into the Great Lakes commercially in 1679 with the lake's first, uh, the first sailing vessel, the Griffin. It was actually a French vessel built by explorer Robert Sir de La Salle. And very quickly they found out that the European designed square rigged vessels weren't really suited. I know we have a sailor in the audience here. Weren't really suited for the water on the Great Lakes. And so the fore and aft rigged sailing vessels came into play in the early 1800s. And we had a surprising discovery. A lot of our discoveries are surprises because we're looking for one vessel and we found another. And in fact, we were looking for the Chikora when we had a bingo. This is the excitement on the boat after you're searching for 10 days and a target like this comes up and you scream bingo and it all seems worth it then. We knew right away looking at the side scan image that we were dealing with a schooner. Don't you all see a schooner there? Uh, real easy. Here's the mast, pointy end, stern. Uh, we knew it was a schooner, we didn't know which one. But we had to get down there and take a look. And this is off South uh, Saugatuck, 275 feet of water, very deep. Um, what we encountered is a, a fairly broken up vessel, um, not like some of these pretty pictures you saw at the beginning. Um, very encrusted, and I'll talk about this, and please notice this um, as we go through some of these videos. Obviously, that's an anchor, a woodstock anchor. That gave us some clue as to the age. Woodstock anchors started, uh, uh, this design started to be manufactured in the mid-1800s. Um, a lot of buildup of zebra mussels, which came into the Great Lakes about 20 years ago. They're a double-edged sword. They've cleaned up our water so that now, even at 275 feet, we have some ambient light. This is a little dark. We played it on the, but here it's lightening up. We have some ambient light at 275 feet. 20 years ago, before the zebra mussels, it would have been pitch black at 100 feet. So we're seeing uh, detail, but the zebra mussels have attached themselves onto everything. So our shipwrecks are becoming sort of like coral encrusted ships that would be in the ocean. But on these first dives down to this wreck that was again a surprising discovery, we were looking for clues as to the identity. It's often not as easy as finding the name board. Something this old, something in this kind of um, decrepit shape is not gonna have a name board. But we did see dead eyes. And these are parts of the sail rigging. But the important thing that we noticed here is there's no lines going through this. That meant that it was rigged with rope rigging rather than the wire rigging that came into play in the late 1800s. And so we knew we were dealing with an early vessel, probably something that was built in the mid 1850s. Um, so I'm gonna, this, this goes on for a while. I'm gonna...